بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الأطهار الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر وما أدراك ما ليلة القدر ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام سلام هي حتى مطلع الفاج صدق الله العلي العظيم Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته O oh Allah, bless me to speak the truth, though be it painful. We're still discussing about the segment about the speaking and telling the truth from Dua Makaram al-Akhlaq by our fourth Imam, Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam. And just for our reminder that we said telling the truth, speaking of the truth, will bring us enemy, will make people, some people to be disliking us, will bring hatred. And it is better. And on the other hand, falsehood and batil is sweet, which Ahlul Bayt have mentioned that clearly. And we said we have to find the truth. This is a reminder about from last night. We have to find the truth and stand firmly and be patient toward the truth. Meaning it's going to be difficult to be with the truth. It's not going to be easy. So how can we get to that? How can we find the truth? And how can we stay firmly and be patient toward the truth? It requires a couple of points. Number one, we have to use our intellect and brain, alaykum as -salam, not our desires. It requires our intellect. And in order for us to be able to use our intellect to find the truth, we have to keep reading and feed it with information. Allah has given us this valuable body part as called aql, intellect. But we need to be able, we have to download softwares into it to be able to use it. Aql by itself, if I have not fed it information, it won't be able to give me and show me the truth when I need it. I give always the example of laptop. Back in the days when we used to buy the laptop, it was completely blank. The hard drive, it was empty. Blank hard drive. You buy the computer, then for example, you want to type, you need to download or buy the software Microsoft Office to be able to type. You want to design, you need to download or buy Adobe Photoshop and so on and so forth. So these informations are the books, hadith, verses of Quran that we read so we can be able to determine what is right, what is the truth and what is the falsehood and wrong to avoid and follow the truth. We have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to for Allah you show me the truth. I'm really really not sure between these two uh, aspects, these two personalities, these two information that I have received. I'm not sure which one is the truth, which one is the falsehood, which one satisfies you and which one doesn't. We have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same way that we ask for everything else when we are about to make decisions on every aspect of our life, we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, show me the truth. And we have to put effort into it. That, oh Allah, I'm just going to sit here and I'm just, I'm hoping, alaykum as I'm hoping that you will show me the truth. No, I have to do jihad toward finding the truth. Toward finding the truth. And Allah says in chapter 29, verse 69, subulana. It's a beautiful verse. That and those whom strive in our cause, striving, jihad, 
working tirelessly to find the truth in this matter, we will certainly guide them to our path, which is the path of Allah, is the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we get to know Arabic words and Arabic grammar, He is emphasizing. First, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَا نَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ Indeed, surely, definitely, if you strive in us, we'll show you the path. We show you the truth. And we say we need the truth in aqeedah, in ahkam, and in akhlaq. And we need to be firm and be patient. And it's not easy. It's not difficult. Today, tonight, the night of the 10th of Ramadan, which tomorrow is the day of wafat of Bibi Khadija, salamullah alayha. Let's have salawat by her name. We hear stories about her and we move on. But if we think a little, about, a little bit about her life, when was the time that she stood firmly with the truth? At the time that everyone abandoned her, everyone rejected her. At the age 28, this is according to our history and according to the history of Ahlul Bayt salam, she got married at age 28 to Rasulullah, not at age 40. That is a completely fabricated and false information that we have been fed that she married at age 40. That is completely false and wrong. At the age 28, she marries a young guy, 25, who doesn't have any money, any wealth. He's only known to be truthful and trustworthy. Everyone was upset with her. And then when he becomes Rasulullah, when he starts his messenger, he was already a prophet. When he starts his mission, she is the first woman to accept her. Alaykum as -salam. Everybody rejected her that how can you accept a person which we are calling him God forbid Majnoon he is Majnoon to us but you are accepting his religion but she stand firmly and she said patient she stand patient firmly next to the Prophet not that because it's my husband no because he is Rasulullah we have to be very very Careful when we read the relationship between Ahlul Bayt السلام, is not only based on because I am related to you, that's why I follow you. No, because of my aqeed and my belief. Imam al Sadiq received salawat by his name. He said, For me, it is more important. My Believe my God accepting Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, is more important to me than me being his grandson. Are you following me? That I am being the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But for me, that has a, that has a status, that has a value. But for me, Ja'far ibn Muhammad and al-Sadiq, for me, accepting the guardianship of Ali has higher value than being the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we don't know our own value to be the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib and what we need to do as his followers. So let us appreciate the life of Lady Khadija sallallahu alayha and what she stood for at the time. And that is the word of Rasulullah. Because Aisha said that everywhere he Rasulullah sat, and went, he kept remi reminding us and remembering Khadija everywhere. She was like, one day I was like, why you mention Khadija so much? You have other women. And she couldn't see that he's mentioning Khadija on and on and on. Every day he rem remembered Khadija. He said, she trusted me and accepted me where was no one accepted and trusted me. Being with the truth. The rest of the wife of the Prophet that they came, they're also Ummul Mu'mineen. But this Ummul Mu'mineen, her value is high. Why? Because she was with Rasulullah where no one was with Rasulullah. In Mecca, where they stoned Rasulullah. They insulted Rasulullah, but she was with him. 
Others, they were in Medina, which Rasulullah has the, uh, she, he is ruling, and uh, people are praising Rasulullah, and he has followers, companions, Muhajirin, Ansar. They were with him, but he was with him at the time of difficult. What do we learn as a wife to a husband? That if I see my husband is being truthful in his belief, in his akhlaq, in his ahkam, we might have difficult time financially. I have to stand with him, not to pressure him that make sure we need this. Even if you have to do some stuff within your business, lie or something, do something that might be haram for you to get our sustenance. No, I don't need that. And she gives all of her wealth to Rasulullah. When we give, that brings us to the next segment and how beautifully her life and her day became between these two segments of number one, being with the truth and being firm and patient. And number two, the second characteristic, which is this verse, this segment of Dua Makaram Al-Akhlaq, which Imam teaches us to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa istiqlal al-khayr wa in kathura min qawli wa fa'li. Oh Allah, bless me to be little. The good in my words and deed, though it be much. When we do something for someone, we think of it to be, wow, I have done a lot. Imam says, oh Allah, bless me. That's a blessing. Be it much I have done for the people. I have given so much charity. I have put so much time in helping a needy person. I'm running a charitable organization. I'm running what I'm running. Oh Allah, bless me to think of it to be a very little that I have done. Because shaitan comes, you pay $100 charity. Wow. You have paid $100 charity. You spend it five, six hours going and helping a needy person in time of their need. Shaitan comes. How much blessing you are doing to this brother? And look, he is not appreciating you. Imam is saying, Oh Allah, bless me to have this characteristic, to be little. My good words that I have told people and my good deeds to, be, to people, be it as much as I have done. We know the meaning of belittling, but let's look at the dictionary. To regard, to regard or portray as less impressive or important than appearances indicate. How much I do effort in this place, how much time I put within myself, I have to think of it to be a very little that I have done. We we'll look at life of Khadija Salamullah alayha. How much wealth that she gave to Rasulullah, that Rasulullah said, Mastaq al-Islam, lawla malu Khadija wa Saifu Ali. Islam wouldn't be able to stand on its own feet if it wasn't by the wealth of Khadija sallallahu alayha and the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam defending Islam from all the attacks. Islam standing on its own feet because of the wealth of Rasulullah. You and I are following the path of Rasulullah because of the wealth of Khadija. But look at her at the time of her death. She cries and she says to her daughter that go to tell your father, I'm embarrassed to ask your father for kafan. I don't have money to buy kafan. If he can give me his abaya for my kafan, I'm embarrassed to ask because I know he doesn't have it. We do something for someone in return. When we go, we're expecting something you have to give me. I'm expecting this. I've done this for you. But Fatima, is, uh, Sayyidah Khadija, عليها, she knows that Rasulullah doesn't have anything. And she's not bragging that I gave all of my wealth to you and to your religion. No. It's a request I have if you can give me your abaya because I don't know how I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Ahl al-Bayt they give us a statement. When Ahl al-Bayt they teach us, we already have the role model which they have applied all of these teachings. When we're talking about these theories, these ideas that we should have within our societies, we already have people who have applied it. And it has been proven that it is doable. We're not talking abstract, no, we're talking 
concrete information, concrete personalities of the people who did apply all of these characteristics. And it is doable. Even if you become to the level of Sayyid Khadija as far, as far as wealth, you can give everything for the sake of Islam and don't have even money for your own kafan. But still, you think of it to be very, very little that I have done for Islam. I have done little for the deen and for Allah and for people and humanity. Khair. Imam is teaching us, وَإِسْتِقْلَالِ الْخَيْرِ وَإِنْ كَثُرُ Well, Allah bless me to belittle the good. Khair, whatever that might be. We have two kinds of khair and good acts. One is the obligatory act, all of our wajibat. And second, it's toward people, to be khair, to show good to other people. Let's discuss both of these. Some of us, not within this community, but another community in another planet, at the time of needs, we pray Turak Asalah, and we're looking and we're waiting minute by minute, we're waiting for Allah's mercy, to be upon us in two, three minutes. If it's five minutes, we say, Allah, you made it late. That is our expectation. We do our salah on time. We're expecting something in return right away. We do fast. We're waiting for something in return. Because in our own mind, when I'm doing something toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an, and I am acting upon the obligatory act, I'm thinking of it to be very, very valuable. Not knowing that if a person does what he does from wajibat, all of his wajibat on time. All of the wajibat. From the time that he becomes baligh until the time that he dies, he, does, he doesn't miss any salah. All of his wajibat on time. His khums on time. His zakat on time. Amr bil ma'roof on time. Jihad. Everything, everything on time. And he doesn't do even one sin. Even one sin he doesn't do. All of his life in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shortcoming. That's why we say Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, let's have salawat by his name. And the dua kumail that we just read and move on, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he sincerely says, Oh Allah, forgive my shortcoming. Ali ibn Abi Talib with his level that no one can understand except Rasulullah and Allah, he said, Oh Allah, forgive my shortcoming. You and I, do we have any, anything to say? Sa'al A'rabi Ali alayhi salam. A person comes to Imam Ali alayhi salam and asks him a question. And darajat al muhabbin On the levels of the lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Show me. I want to know. Are there levels for the people who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or all we love it equally? There are no levels. Mahiyya. What are those levels? Qala adna darajatihim. The lowest of the lovers of Allah. I consider myself lover of Allah. Look, if I if this applies to me, he says, "Adna darajatim, the lowest of these levels, man istasghara ta'atahu, the one who belittles his amount of worship that he has done toward Allah Subhanahu wa Taala." Number one, not that I pray two rak'ah salah, not that after after Ramadan, thirty days of Ramadan. Did you see Allah? Thirty days of Ramadan, it was so difficult. I went outside. I hope I can get something on the day of Eid. As soon as I finish, I'm waiting. Imam says, belittling your worship. Number one. And every sin that he, cre that he commits, he thinks of these sins to be the greatest sin that he has committed. It's not only one lie I lied, Shaykhna. Not only one gossip I have committed. Not one time I raised my voice against my parents. It was only one small sin, Sheikh. One small sin. Imam says the lowest is the one that he thinks of his sin to be the greatest sin that he has committed. And he thinks that he is the only one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been going to ask for. How much sins that he has committed. This Arab guy, he fainted because he saw if this is the lowest level, 
I haven't been even I haven't reached the lowest level of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet. When he got his conscious, because reaching this level is very, very high for me to belittle all of my good deeds and all of my wajibat and to think of my sins to be the greatest sin that I have committed. Are there levels above this? There are 70 levels above this level that I have told you yet. How much I have to work toward all the wajibat and think of it to be little. And as soon as I want to commit any sin, think of it to be the greatest sin that one can commit and I avoid. That's toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belittling all of the good things that we have done so far. Toward people, if I have good demeanor, good akhlaq toward people. Imam says, Alaykum bi a'mal al khair, fatabadaruha wa la yakun ghayrukum ahaqqa biha minkum. Run, act upon all the good deeds toward other people. Make sure no one else precedes you in committing and in acting about these good deeds. Unfortunately, this is a very, very upsetting statement to say, but it's statistics that. United States of America, that some people in the West, East, they called it a, a Baladul Kufr, a Kufr country, which they call it Baladul Kufr, which we cannot call Baladul Kufr. All the earth, all the, all the grounds are belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Earth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They call this country Baladul Kufr, it is number one in paying charity and helping the needy people. Isn't that upsetting? And we call this country Balad al Kuf. And Kuffar, they are number one in the world at the amount, the amount of charity and donation that they give for the needy and for humanitarian cause. And we call our Muslim country Islamic country, that we pay $110 billion for weapons. Who? Because we got completely away from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt salam, where Imam says, make sure nobody else precedes you in doing what is good toward other people. You should be front line in helping the needy people. You Muslims supposed to be the front line, no one else. Because you have role models within your religion, within your faith. Another beautiful hadith by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. <laughs> Beautiful hadith. Beautiful hadith. Ammar al Sayyidati comes to the Imam. Qultu la Abi Abdullah, Imam al Sadiq, Ju'altu Fidaq, may my life be sacrificed for you. Al Mu'min rahmatun ala al Mu'min. Can a believer be merciful to another Mu'min? Can I be merciful to you? Can I be the fact, be the mercy towards you or not? Qala na'am. Yes, a mu'min can be mercy to the next person. قلت, How can that be possible? وكيف ذاك قال أيما مؤمن أتى أخاه في حاجة If you come to me, you as a believer, come to me at the time of need. And you help me. ذلك رحمة من الله ساقها إليه you coming to me at the time of need, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy that put in front of you. I had a need. I saw Allah. I have a need. I want you to grant my need, whatever that need might be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places my need in front of you. And Imam says, if, if you grant me my need, you've been accepting Allah's rahmah upon yourself. And if you were 
to completely abandon my need and not to grant me my need if you say no I can't sorry I don't have time I don't have money I can't but you were able to do it you have said to the rahmah of Allah sorry I don't need rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do you see where we're getting where are we going with it if someone comes to you and say I have a need that I want you to help me Please help me. Allah is sending that person to you. He wants to be merciful to you. We say, Allah, this kind of mercifulness, I don't need it from you. I'll put it aside. Show me another mercy. This kind of mercy, I don't accept it as a mercy. But if I accept it, I am accepting Allah's mercy upon me to grant someone's need. I always tell my community, imagine our maraja, may Allah prolong in their life that how high level they are within our community. If a marja today calls you directly and he says, I, I need you for something. There is someone I want you to go and do this for me. Basically, you have been hired by marja taqlid to do something. How honor that brings us that helping a marja taqlid. Or within our secular life, a president calls you and he tells you, I need you to do something directly. I want you to go and do something. I'm working for the president. Well, when someone comes with their need, you're becoming an employee of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is hiring you. I want to give you mercy. Go help this needy servant of mine in any way that is possible. And last hadith of, hadith of tonight from Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You might say, Shaykh, I don't have people come at the time of need financially. I don't have money. But Allah has given me status within the community. Allah has given me a reputation. Rasulullah says, and Allah ta'ala Allah on the day of Qiyamah will come to me. Will say, Shaykh Mustafa, I gave you status within the community for people to respect you. You didn't have money to pay for the sake of Allah. You were in need yourself. But I gave you words and I gave you, I gave you honor and I gave you reputation. Did you use your reputation and your status to helping a needy person? A needy person comes to me, says I have a need. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask me, did you use that? How can I use it? I go to a brother and say, brother, I beg for, not for myself. I'm begging for a needy person. Please, brother, there is a needy sister. There is a needy community. There is a needy individual. I want you to help me so I can help that. If I do that, I can say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, I did use my reputation. When you ask and beg, it's not something nice. It's humiliating. It's okay. I am humiliating myself in front of people, not for myself, for, for someone. فَيَقُولْ يَا عَبْدِي رَزَقْتُكَ جَاهًا Oh my servant, I gave you reputation. I gave you status. فَهَلْ أَنْتَ بِهِ مَظْلُومًا Did you help? With your status, with your reputation, did you help an oppressed individual? Or did you help a person at the time of need and difficult? If I have reputation within the community, I have to use it. I will finish with one story. I know I'm about to, I am running out of my time. One story and inshallah I will finish this. My father tells me this story. From late Grand Ayatollah said Muhammad Shirazi Rahmatullah Alayh, a great marja. He's like, Shaykh, telling me, he's like, I saw this marja sitting, writing what he has written, 1600 books, 1600 books he has written within Islam, and establishing more than 1000 organizations. A great marja. He's sitting, and there is a wealthy Kuwaiti individual sitting next to him. Sayyid is humiliating himself. He's begging this Kuwaiti wealthy individual for some money, donation, so they can establish a Husseinia or an orphanage or a place for widows or a hospital or a library. And this Kuwaiti, you know, when you have money, Alhamdulillah, that some people don't have money because when they have money, that becomes a time for them that they will slip. 
And this person sitting with arrogance said, Alhamdulillah, yeah, I mean, I have money. And Sayyid, my father said, I saw him, he's humiliating himself in front of this individual. Marja taqlid, in front of a wealthy person. He left and he didn't pay anything. My father said, I wanted to say it. I told him, Sayyid, you humiliated yourself in front of him. You put, it, you put your reputation on the line and your place. He knows this hadith. He said, Sheikh, Allah will bring you on the day of judgment and he will say, Muhammad, you used your hand. You wrote 1,600 books, all the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Thank you. You used your legs. You went for the sake of Allah putting people together, establishing community, thank you. You used your tongue, you gave thousands of hours of lecture, thank you. Did you use your reputation, ma ul waj? Did you use your status as a marja taqlid to serve Ahl al-Bayt or not? I will tell him, yes, that place that I begged that individual to help your cause, to build something for the community, I put my reputation on the front line for you, O Allah. And Allah will say, yes, you did. With my hand, helping the cause of Allah, Ahl al-Bayt, and the needy people. With my tongue, helping the cause of Allah, Ahl al-Bayt, and the needy people. With my legs, helping the cause of Allah, Ahl al-Bayt, and the needy people. With my ears, with, my, with all of my, my body parts, I have to help the cause of Allah, Ahl al-Bayt, and the needy people. That is the zakat of my body parts that I have to pay, and that's an obligatory. Let's have a loud salawat.